I'm still learning every day and I'm facing challenges every day. And I think that's important. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I will be speaking with one of the founding partners of Archimania, Todd Walker. So Archimania is a firm that is nationally ranked 8th in design, 24th in sustainability, and in the top 50 for interior architects. Todd has chaired and juried numerous design award programs, including the American Institute of Architects in DC, um, the AIA Indiana, Louisiana, Mississippi, New Orleans, um, the National Construction, National Development Awards, and a whole load more. He was also elected to the College of Fellows of the American Institute of Architects for his notable contributions to the, to the design field in 2009, which places him in the top 1% of architects nationwide. During that same year, Todd was only one of nine university alumni named Mississippi State University's Alumni Fellow of the Year. And in April of 2014, Todd was the recipient of the Francis Gassner Award for his contributions to design. He works in the community and beyond and is a passionate promoter of design excellence. He has continually transformed modest projects into more than 150 award-winning works of national significance. As a result, his work has been consistently recognized by national, regional, state, and local award programs. He's been featured in a dozen books and published in the Architectural Record, Architecture, Builder, Custom Home, Metropolitan Home, Residential Architect, The New York Times, AIA Architect, and Arc Daily. And now, of course, Business of Architecture. So it was a real privilege and a pleasure to speak with Todd. Um, great to find out as well that he was also uh, an alumni of the Bartlett School of Architecture here in London, which is where I studied. And uh, we discussed a little bit about that. In the episode, we go deep onto a number of subjects. We look at answering the question, how do you advance and contribute to a city as well as a business? How do you create a sense of belonging and inclusivity in a business? What's the role of transparency and how far should transparency go? And we also look at the mindset of a partner of an architecture practice. And Todd discusses how this is not for everybody and nor should it be. And uh, nor is it the pinnacle of a career, which I think is a very important and useful conversation uh, to be having. So sit back, relax and enjoy Todd Walker of Archimania. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Todd, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Great, and thank you. I'm happy to be here. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show. So you are one of the founding partners of Archimania. Um, yes. I know that you studied in Mississippi originally, and then you actually, we shared the university, you were at the Bartlett as well. Yes, in London. at the Bartlett School in London, yes. When, when was that? That was my the beginning of the fourth year in college. So we had a um, exchange program at Mississippi State, and I believe that it took place at Plymouth for many years. We were the first class or the first group right. to go to London uh, at the Bartlett School. Oh, very exciting! So you would know you know Bloomsbury quite well then. Yes, yes, the, very well. Areas. Who was the dean of the school at that time? Oh, remember? it's a good question. You're asking me to remember uh, many, many years ago. You know, I don't recall the dean of the school. Um, it was, it was, it was uh, pre-Peter Cook, I'm imagining. You know, um, that name rings a bell. Maybe it was. I don't, I don't recall. Got it. No worries. No worries. Yeah. Well, very, I'm, I'm, glad we, I'm glad we've got a bit of shared architectural yes. heritage there. Lineage, Absolutely. If you like. So you've, you've chaired numerous design award programs. You were elected to the College of Fellows of the AIA in 2009. 
you've lectured extensively all around the the US um and as we said you know one of the founding partners of of Archimania and you guys have got a very diverse portfolio i know you you like to describe it as a kind of progressive niche if you like yes. but you've yeah. got you've got projects in performing arts education sector you know n- numerous um private houses as well as multifamily housing offices healthcare it's it's a diverse and stunning portfolio of really interesting and eclectic work so thank you i think i think my first my first question is where where did the name come from oh well you're taking me back to college again <laughs> um in in fourth year the second semester of fourth year we had a a um 24-hour project where we had to design a multifamily project. We couldn't leave our desk. And we were sort of challenged by some of the professors that to think of it like we had our own firm. And some of us decided to sort of name the firm. So the naming actually came in college. And it was sort of a, an idea and a dream of how you sort of think about architecture. And, and so the, the word mania really came from being passionate about architecture and our love for design and improving the built environment. Oh, amazing. So it's it's such a a, a name that's harking back to your student days. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, it was funny when we started the firm, you know, we we hired an ad agency and we thought a lot about names and they went back and forth and we had a really, really tough time. We didn't want to use our last names. We wanted something that could be more legacy oriented. Mm -hmm. And... I, one day we were sitting in a meeting and I, I thought back to that time. And so I said, Hey, I want to just throw something out. And when I did, you know, everyone latched onto it. Um, the ad agency thought it was great. And so we, we played with that name for a few months. We looked at, you know, different logos and things like that. We had some really corny logos in the early, early studies of that, but yeah, that's how the name came about. It started in college. And obviously, it lends itself nicely to each one of the the team being an archimaniac, or like, yeah. or, or any of your clients can be archimaniacs as well. Which... Absolutely. Well, you know, it's this idea really of inclusiveness, so that we think about. I mean, we use the word collaboration a lot. I mean, you hear that mm-hmm. in architecture firms, you know, all the time. But I think you know the idea of the name being inclusive as well, so that we all share a part of that. I mean, you don't have to be a shareholder, for example, to share. Uh, in this naming and in this idea that we're all together, you know, in what we're doing, and what we're trying to achieve. So what were some of the first projects then that you you were taking on? And, and, I, and I guess one of the things that's interesting for me, and, and excuse my geographical ignorance at being a Brit, um, and I, I, I do have a, a, you know, a really a deep interest in, you know, Tennessee and Arkansas and Alabama and these kinds of parts of America and, you know, the kind of architectural heritage and legacy that we're starting to, to see there. So it's so interesting yeah. to see these, kind, you know, the, you know, yourself, um, Marlon Blackwell on a Lotus studio we were discussing last time. There's some really amazing architecture that's coming from this, from this region. Um, yeah. So there's two, two parts of that question. Why Tennessee? Why Memphis? And what were the first kind of projects that you were involved in? Yeah, okay. Oh, That's a really good question because I think that um, I talk a lot about our geographical area. I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, if you, care, if you compare Marlin uh, up in the hills of Arkansas and Moda Studio, for example, they're in a, a different kind of context uh, than where we are in Memphis, which borders Arkansas by the Mississippi River. And, you know, a lot of the diversity and a lot of the culture that comes out of Memphis comes from this sort of these things that converge that move down the Mississippi River that divide Arkansas and Tennessee, connect us to Mississippi. So we're in this sort of tri-state region. And, you know, there's there are a lot of farmlands around us. So there's these rural countrysides. Um, There's this urban fabric, you know, in Memphis where we are, and they all converge right, you know, at the river. And, you know, I, I think of I think of the things that have happened along the river. It's where I think it's where we get a lot of our culture from. You know, we mm-hmm. think about blues music. I mean, it came from the river. It moved from Chicago. It moved down you know, to New Orleans, and um, it's it's it came right through Memphis. You know, cotton. It's a it's a rural thing. It's a, it came from a farming community, and and it was transported right here off the cobblestones in mm-hmm. Memphis. 
hardwoods, you know, uh, hardwoods came from Mississippi and Arkansas and Tennessee. Again, they moved down the river. So you had this convergence of these things and those hardwoods, you know, made our buildings. They made these cotton warehouses that we stored cotton and flour and things like that in. And so uh, I'm sort of leading up to this diversity in our project type with this, because if you think about Memphis and the people that make up Memphis, they're not unlike what I just described. Many of them may have grown up in the city, Mm -hmm. but they had parents or grandparents that grew up in the Delta, in the rural areas of Mississippi and Arkansas and Tennessee. So there's this idea about, you know, working with your hands. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of this really, really wonderful mixture of blue collar and white collar workers and workers that I think that care about, you know, their craft and what they've done. And so, you know, Back um, many, let's just say in the early 1900s, I think there was this real craft that took place in the buildings in the city. And then and then we, we moved forward to like the mid-century and we had a lot of wonderful mid-century architects here that did some really great work. And so I guess growing up, I saw a lot of this work being this kid that grew up in the country in Arkansas. I didn't grow up in Memphis. So I was I always came to the city and admired the city, uh, wanted to be a part of it. You know, I, I understood, I understood the country. I didn't understand the city so much. So this diversity, I think, uh, that, that came from that early understanding sort of feeds into the diversity of work that, that we do. Um, and the, and the kind of work that I think helps sort of build our city, um, and make it, um, this really sort of active, um, urban place. So, you know, the, the first projects probably like, probably like many firms, uh, that sort of getting started, we sort of took a lot of small projects that didn't have big budgets. And some of them were interior projects. Uh, some were housing. Um, I remember one in particular, which was were some townhomes. Uh, it's called GE5 townhomes that we did for a client that we started work with in the probably 1997. So just after we started the business in 1995. And so what was interesting about these townhomes is we were we were the firm that was taking sort of a modern, more progressive take on these things, and we were right on the edge of an of an arts district and a historic arts district. So how did, how did we sort of deal with context and how did we mix these materials and really how do we think about the craft that went into this? So I think that level of craft is what we really started with on all of our projects and sort of understanding how it worked in the budget because for many years we did a lot of, a lot of work and continue to do a lot of work with really tight budgets. You right. know, here, here in Memphis, we're sort of, I like to say we're outside the centers of fashion. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not, we're not in London. We're not in New York. We're not in Chicago. Uh, we're in this place that is really still trying to understand, you know, what, what architecture means to the city. You know, I think the, the mid-century architects were trying to develop this progressive city. And I think that was probably at, at one point was when our city was probably the most progressive and I think in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years, our city is stored, sort of understanding what that means, I think, to the city. And progressive architecture, modern architecture can help make a city more progressive. You know, I think I, I like to use the phone, our phone as an analogy often, you know, this iPhone or the this sort of new modern phone that we all carry around. I mean, can you imagine uh, walking around with a phone that's 30 years old, right? It doesn't seem very forward thinking uh it doesn't seem of the time where where we work and where we live and and i think that's what our architecture is trying to do for the city so you know we started on those small interiors that had lots of little budgets that we were able to what we found early is we were really able to perform well for a client with a tight budget because they allowed you to stretch they wanted the most you know the most you could give them out of their budget so we could be forward thinking we could be creative innovative uh, we could sort of think outside of the box. And those were those buzzwords, you know, I think we used a lot early on. And what we found in in our city is people were a little concerned about the word modern. You know, it's, what did that mean? Was it harsh? Was it cold? Was it brutal? Um, and so we started thinking about that. And, and really, we thought, well, you know, you can use 
the word modern in a lot of a lot of different ways in content in the context of architecture. But progressive maybe was a word that was very positive. Mm-hmm. Who would not want to progress, right? Who would not want their city to progress and to move forward? And so we sort of latched onto that. And I think we've over time we've sort of built our projects um, and designed them with with that idea mm-hmm. uh, that we're trying to move the client forward, the project type, the city. Um, and that's, that's given us lots of opportunities to do, you know, as you sort of shared earlier, uh, a lot of diverse work. And I think that, you know, our focus has been work in the city. Um, you know, there, there are firms in, in our region that have spent a lot of time focusing uh, in other areas. And so this, idea of having some uh, national acclaim. And I think that our our focus has been more on our city. I mean, that's really why this firm was started. I I think that I I felt early on there was a need in our city for more more progressive work, more modern work, and things that sort of broke the norm. They weren't so so much status quo. And I think that's when, when when cities have too much status quo, it really takes a toll on the city. You know, I mean, our city talks, Ryan, a lot about how do you bring new, new young people, young professionals, young workers into the city. There's all these ways that you can think about amenities within the city that draw them into your place. But I think architecture, you know, can be a big part of that, yeah. how we approach architecture and those project types. So with some of these early projects that you were that you were getting involved in that had quite tight budgets, but it kind of you know you had the space to be able to be inventive and and make those budgets work. How did you make with the you know what were the fees like? How did, how did you manage to make it work? And because sometimes we often find that we the, the 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 construction budget is is small which means there's another level of rigor in terms of the design and the creativity which has a time cost to it if you like how yeah. how did you kind of balance that certainly in the in the earlier earlier days of kind of not overspending on the budget in terms of time rather than yeah. making the materials do the work yeah, well, that that's a really uh, sort of intriguing question because it has a lot of little tentacles uh, to it. <laughs> you know, we within those budgets, we I think our clients were often generous enough to us. They knew that we were a young firm. They knew that we had different ideals than some of the other firms, and so they at least tried to be fair with us and. But, you know, even if you're getting a, a reasonably good fee on a really low budget project, it's still a pretty pretty low fee. Yeah. But, you know, I think over time we learned how to, to deal with that um, in a way that we could be profitable. One of the things I was really conscious of early on and still am aware of is how long some really good firms in our city have been around in the city. And some of them didn't last long. They didn't last to a second generation, for example. And I didn't want that to be the case. I mean, all the way going, hearkening back to the name Archimania, you know, I wanted it to be a firm that could exist for many, many generations. Mm -hmm. And in, in thinking about fees related to that, we, I wanted to use that as a stepping stone. So if we could, if we could make it work on these small, lower budget projects, what would that allow us to do? Well, one of the things that came up, our, our city is a very um, generous um, philanthropy city. Um, it's a very giving city. We have people here that, that spend a lot of money and share a lot of money making good things happen for the city. Hmm. And so we were able, I think, early on to start working with some nonprofits. And it was another option where we saw that in the past, or we seem to think that a lot of a lot of firms hadn't really spent a fair amount of time in really caring about, they thought of the project more of a necessity mm-hmm. uh, to, you know, make sure it had a, you had a dry roof, um, you know, over your head and you had a, a great structure, et cetera, et cetera. Well, of course we needed to cover all those bases, but you know, how, how could you take a nonprofit and sort of raise them up, make them uh, going back to being equitable, I think, you know, 
how do we how do we make architecture equitable in our city? And I think we we had the ability to work for some nonprofits, and those became projects that have extended even today. You know, twenty eight years after the firm was was started, um, it it's something that's continuing to build who we are. And you know, nonprofits are anywhere from a, a very small organization that might have you know a thousand square feet and a twenty thousand dollar budget to you know a very large um, medical uh, hospital type project or even a museum. You know, I shared with I think I've shared with you that we're working on the Brooks Museum here. Um, so we're really fast forwarding and thinking about you know what those projects have that, done for that's us. That's the one that you're doing with um, Herzog on Demiron. Yes, yes, we're working with them. They're the design consultant. Um, we're the architect uh, here in Memphis on the job, and you know this this sort of camaraderie um, f- through the beginning of understanding budgets to working with a budget um, that that is is a really good budget for a museum, but one that you still have to sharpen your pencil um, and make sure that you can achieve everything that that needs that you need to achieve for this. I mean, I think like this, this Brooks Museum project is one that, you know, I, I would say I've sort of our entire um, background as a firm has sort of built us. It's almost like we've been physically training, you know, for this, for this project over time. And when I say that, I mean, in it's the idea that it's still diverse. Um, it's something that harkens back to this idea of the connection to the river. I mm-hmm. mean, this is, on the on the Mississippi River Bluff, it looks out onto the Mississippi. It's an anchor site in our city, um, and it's one where all these sort of things that converge that I talked about earlier happen. You know, for example, we have this really wonderful heavy timber structure in the building. Um, you know, and I think about those warehouses and those things that I thought about early on in our firm, places where we did a lot of interiors. A lot of projects for a lot of different clients, from office to construction um, clients, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it, it and it thinks about joining um, all the people in our city in one place. And I think like that's those are the kinds of things that happened at the river, you know, many years ago. I mean, mm-hmm. I think about blue, how blues like draws us in as people. I mean, you're you're in London. I suspect you you really like the blues and you're, you would feel connected to some place when you hear a song. I mean, I heard one yeah. the other day, I'd never heard this song. And, and I just sat in my car before I got out and walked in the office because I felt like, you know, it really, it really connected me to, to this place. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I didn't know the artist. I didn't know where the song came from, but I felt that. And I think that, a lot of projects that we're working on in the city now, you know, we have some mixed use projects that are right on the streetscape, right on the, right on the sidewalk. Our office is in Midtown. So it's, it's been, it's really interesting. We, um, we, we started downtown. We were there for 25 years. Uh, and then we moved to Midtown. Uh, the Brooks Museum has been in Midtown for much longer than 25 years. And now they're moving downtown. And you know we're focusing here in Memphis on everything sort of what I call the the core of the city. So we have the the parkways. So these these three parkways that wrap um, three sides of our city, and the river borders the fourth side, and that's really our city proper. You know, once you get out of that, it starts moving in the direction more like suburbia. Mm-hmm. But it's, you know, it's a transitional. As you go further out, it becomes more suburban. But within those parkways, those are places where we can really make a difference as mm. architects because we find that our city has begins to lose a lot of its urbanity uh, by it just breaking down over time. And we're trying to be part of rebuilding that. How do you work with, say, a, a company like Herzog and De Muron then, who are, who are based in, you know, in, in Basel and in, in Switzerland and a, a very different kind of climate and environment to, to Memphis? Are you acting like kind of cultural translators as well? Or how does <laughs> yeah, that, well, that must be quite an interesting in process from, from having their kind of perspective as well on what they're culturally picking up on and then obviously you guys knowing from the from the grassroots level the kind of diversity that's there um how have you kind of kind of helped manage that process as 
as you know stewards yeah. in a way of the culture yeah uh well you know I, what we found about herzog de Miron is that they sort of operate the way we do it's just on a a different scale. You know, their firm is a different scale and their projects are often mostly a different scale, much larger scale than what we generally do. But but we found the way they look at culture and context and under try to understand the city where they work um, was really, really important to them and it's important to the project. And so, yes, so not only are we the architect for the job, but yeah, I like your, I like your words, sort of like the, the cultural uh, translator in a way. So making sure that they understand parts of our city that, you know, you, you may not sort of understand sort of the, the underbelly, you know, of, of what you might see here. Mm -hmm. And I think like, you know, like any, any, any city, it sort of has its own complexities. It has the things that, you know, that you really want to bring out and the things that maybe have been lost over time that you need, you need to find again. Yeah. And, you know, I, it's really, I mean, it's amazing how we can all work together now, really being far apart. I mean, look where you are, and we're doing this this podcast today, and you know, we're there's a lot of water between us, uh, much more than the Mississippi River. <laughs> um, but you know, it's you could be in the next room, and yeah. uh, you know, I, I think that it's been a really a really great process, you know, so far. Um, we're working on CDs now, and we're really moving in a direction to make sure we get this built. Um, and occupied and and let it really start you know changing our city because I think it is a project that that brings much change with it mm. um, and we Amazing. look forward to it being built soon so the, the the practice has been around for the best part of thirty plus years or so um, and you've gone through or you would have weathered a number of kind of economic troubles in terms of you know you know, the 2000 kind yeah. of contraction, you yeah. would have gone, you would have survived uh, one in the late nineties, um, obviously 2008. Um, what have been some of your strategies for kind of weathering those kinds of economic storms? What did you, what have you found has worked? What have you found didn't work? Yeah. Um, well, we're a pretty tight group here and we're not a firm that, philosophically thinks that we should load up the firm for a bigger project mm -hmm. and then lose people after that project's over if we can't replace it. We've been very, although we're, we don't do, uh, people don't think of us as doing conservative architecture. We really have a conservative business model. And, mm. and I think it's because of the things I said earlier, I, I've seen other firms that have, that started and tried a more modernist approach and, it's not that they were short lived, but they, you know, we maybe have been around maybe longer than any firm in the city that's sort of had the same kind of mantras that, that mm. we have. And, you know, I think that in, in, in thinking about how we've managed it, you know, you're right. I mean, we've 2008 through 2012 or 13, we had this really terrible recession. Uh, recently, we've gone through a pandemic, and you know, even when we started the firm in 1995, uh, there wasn't a recession, but things weren't um, necessarily going gangbusters uh, in the architectural community and mm -hmm. the construction community. So, I think that you know, we just have to be really lean and resilient. Um, you have to make really good decisions, and I think you know, I think we. We don't shy. I, I think this idea of diversity, actually, diversity in our project types sort of paid off for us. I mean, if you if you think about there are certain firms that are just, say, hospital firms, medical firms, and they're sort of safeguarded. They generally say, hey, you know, that's one of the things that you just safeguard your firm. You do medical work. You'll probably never miss a beat. Mm -hmm. Well, we're much more diverse than that. And I think if if of a multifamily sector slows down maybe veterinary medicine picks up you know something that we have some background in and we've had the ability to take on many different types of projects because our portfolio is deep in that sense um, and we can and and i think that we've we've also shown i think because of this idea of creativity and out-of-the-box thinking innovation architecture 
that we've had the ability to persuade clients and let them understand that even if it's a project type we haven't done before, that's where we might excel because we're mm-hmm. going to think of it. We're not going to assume that we know how to do this project for them. There's much more that should inform us. And, you know, we've, we've had many first, you know, we've had theaters like Hattie Lou theater. We've had ballet Memphis and collage uh, dance collective. I mean, those were, those were all first, a ballet first, a theater first. Um, we're doing a, a nonprofit for Girls Inc. that's outside of the city. It's a girl's farm. And we've taken this really long concept design and we're housing it with a place to teach girls how to cook the food from the farm. Uh, we work with them to move their corporate offices out there. And then there are classrooms out there. You know, taking a project like that, um, you, you're learning but you're also teaching a client um, what are other opportunities that you might not mm-hmm. be seeing. So, so I, I think all of those things combined have at least let us weather those storms. You know, there was, there was one year toward the end of the recession that was, you know, was very painful. Um, you know, we, we all, all of the staff, we all agreed to cut salaries um, so we could stay together. Um, mm-hmm. we, we could have laid people off or we could have all taken a reduction and we sort of took a unanimous or we took a vote and it was a unanimous decision that we'd all take a a percent cut. And the partners, me and my business partner took a substantially uh, deeper cut during that time, but we wanted to keep every, we had built something. We felt like it was strong. We wanted to continue building it and we didn't want to lose what we had started. And I think, you know, saying that, you know, the other thing that I would say, would be, um, I've talked a lot about projects, um, but our staff, I mean, our Archimaniacs, I mean, I think we have the best group we've ever had, uh, not mm. to take anything away, but, you know, it's it gets be- better as, as we build it. Um, and I, I think we have a group here, and we've had groups in the past where they understand the types of projects we're doing, the types of clients we're working for, they understand that we need to be agile on how we, you know, approach it and sort of we're, we all sort of have the same kind of vision for what this place is. We don't have the same vision about what we're doing on any you know, given project at any given moment. But I think just having this sort of philosophical vision allows us um, to be unified and, mm-hmm. and really work well together. So, you know, I'm really I'm really proud that we've. You know, probably a third of our office has been here 15 years or longer. Wow. Um, you know, so we're a 28 year old firm, like you said, almost 30 years old. I'm sort of becoming the old guy or one of the old guys, <laughs> you know, now. Um, but I still, I think, you know, keeping this sort of young attitude um, is really important. And I think all of the people, the younger people in this office all, always should be the most important people because they're the yeah. ones that are, that are bringing this sort of new excitement, this new ideals, this, these, this new thinking, um, new approaches, you know, how do we do things? I mean, I, even seeing what um, they can do uh, electronically, digitally, you know, it's yeah. far different when we started. When we started the firm, we had parallel bars. I mean, I remember when we bought our first two computers <laughs> and we were trying to figure out like, you know, what's this internet thing uh, that, we're all going to be, are we going to be exchanging emails? Um, wow. Could you imagine drawing on that one day? So, you know, how far, how far even technology has changed since 1995? I mean, it's, it's how, been amazing. And it, and it allows us to work with a firm like Herzog Demeron or others um, mm. in, in working together to, to transform a city and build a project. How have you nurtured that talent then over the years in terms of, you know, if you've got people who have been there for 15 years and, you know, how have you helped them move into leadership positions? What sorts of, you know, how have you managed their their performance? What kind of culture have you created of growth um, yeah. that's that's had people become very loyal to the company? Yeah, well, I think we, we've always approached the firm as we've we've had this really flat hierarchy, mm-hmm. and it 
what that means really is, you know, again, going back to the name Archimania, we should all be part of this and own part of this name and what it what it means. And I think that means that everyone has a voice, you know, and I've I've always feel, you know, we we talk a lot about project teams. And I think that a person can influence a project that's not on a project team. We could have a young associate that just started work here and walk past a design critique and have one or two comments and it could change the thinking of a, of a project. Oh, what if, what if you did this? Or what about, have you guys thought about this? Have you ever seen this material before? And, and I think that, making sure that everyone has a place to grow um, is, is important and develop. So, so fast forward, we have this really flat hierarchy. And then probably about four years ago or so, when we moved in this new office that we're in in Midtown, we had a retreat, which we try to have every year. We've not always done that every year, but we try to do that every year. We had a retreat. And I think it was because there were a lot of people that were sort of beginning to be stressed about some things like, well, maybe we're too flat. You know, right. maybe we need to, we talk about mentorship and we talk about leaders and uh, how do, how does younger or less experienced staff come in and really understand how they learn? Who do they learn from? and Who are the more senior people, et cetera, et cetera. So we had a really long discussion about that. Like, how do we keep this sort of flat, but have more hierarchy? Although no one wanted to use that word. Yeah. Uh, and how do we set it up so we have good mentorship? So we didn't, everyone agreed we didn't want corporate titles. We didn't want to think of this as titles or anything like that. But we sort of set out this thing where everyone that's here is an Archimaniac. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have associates and senior associates, principals, and partners. So me and my business partner, for example, have been principals for all these years. We actually became partners. And we set up a position where we could have a principal, which would mean that someone that is actually moving toward being a partner. So, but each one of those levels, people can experience it different ways. People mm -hmm. have a way to think about what does this senior associate mean? This sort of leadership group in the office. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've also tried to, you know, have, we have this mindset. And I think this is really important that not everyone should be a partner. Mm -hmm. You know, not not everyone that you shouldn't think that you're should striving to be a partner. Um, sometimes I wish I could take that hat and just be an Archimaniac, right? <laughs> you know, but I, you know, I don't I don't think it's right for everyone, and I don't think that everyone's right for the firm. You know, in being that in that position, mm -hmm. and I, I think you really have to take a serious look at. How, how do people, how do people move? How do they learn from each other? And then how do we make sure this is an environment where they stay? And I mean, I think, you know, culturally it has a lot to do too with the, the cultural diversity of projects, because mm -hmm. I think that there are a number of people, especially younger people where they can come in here, you know, and you could, you could start uh, today, you could have a finished um, design project in three months and you can see it built in the next nine months. So within a year, you actually, you sort of got your hands wet, yeah, dirty. You got to see something be built and then you're starting to sort of analyze your skills, you know, in a different way. So I think, you know, keeping people challenged, you know, I feel, um, I turned 60, um, and then, well, in the next couple of weeks, and I think, like, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's, a, it's been a long time coming. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I'm still learning mm. um, every day and I'm facing challenges every day. Um, and I think I think that's important because when we stop, we really we're probably are resting on our laurels or we're just have become complacent. And I think this idea of. Um, being motivated and not being complacent is a real driving factor here. You know, self-motivation, let's all be excited about what we're doing. And um, I, so think, I think that goes a long way. It's interesting how you, you say that 
you know, you want to kind of keep that the flatness of the of the office, but also there was a need for some kind of hierarchy, but not wanting to call it a hierarchy. But there is so right. it's kind of like there there needs to be leadership and, yeah. and, and and acknowledge there are people at different levels of experience that can learn from other people who who do have the experience and how does that how is that institutional knowledge kind of passed down to the next generation if you like yeah no that's exactly right i mean it it really it really is about leadership and and we we use that word often because mm -hmm. we you know we might have a team leader a project leader but i think we would tell anyone on the team that everyone should be a leader you should Think of yourself as owning that project, yep. no matter what part of it you're working on. You know, every part of it is a design moment. Um, no part should be separated out. And, and I think that that allows people to grow, you know, as, as well. It, it allows you to sort of flex your muscles um, and and push really hard. So, yeah, I, I think that's important. In the conversation about leadership, um, obviously the, the the business is getting to that stage in maturity where you know it's twenty eight years old. You, you, you're you might be thinking about the next steps for yourself, or you might not be. Um, but certainly, I would imagine there's there's another there's a kind of uh, another another generation of leadership who's looking to you know take the reins or take more control of certain things. How is that process of succession and, you know, nurturing the next generation taking place or, or that, that conversation around how do p new people become partners into the business? Yeah. Well, I, that's a conversation that started with this whole sort of retreat and leadership. Right. You know, what does it mean? What is the future? Um, my business partner is uh, about seven years older than I am. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he will, in theory, be the first person that sort of moves out of that role and someone else into a partnership role. And I think, you know, currently we have a principal in the office and that should be the person that moves into that role. Mm -hmm. And and then we should be able to fill, you know, then the next step is, do we have one principal or do we have two? I mean, how does that work? And I don't, right now we don't, we sort of have a guide, but we don't have rules. Because yeah. I think, you know, it's just like this idea of res resiliency. We need to be resilient. We need to be flexible. We need to be able to adapt. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, thinking about the next leaders, I mean, I would like to think that five or six or seven more years under the the youngest principal, for example, would be a, another person that's or people that are moving in that direction. You know, now I'm mean, really, really really proud that we have uh, a lot of female designers and architects mm -hmm. in our office. I mean, that's something that, uh, you know, in the first maybe 10 years, we were mostly a male dominated firm and we consciously wanted to try to take on that challenge that we know that the AIA and architects or our profession is, is sort of dealing with. Yeah. As, keeping women in the profession and making sure that this is a good environment for them to work in. And, you know, we, we also have um, two young African-American um, young architects mm -hmm. with us, a male and a female. And it's, it's also nice to know that we're trying to move in, in a direction that, that we want this to be sort of like our work, you mm -hmm. know, more inclusive, uh, more about equality, whether it's a nonprofit or whether it's in our office. And, and I think all that young talent, you know, I look forward to seeing who the next leaders are really, uh, because I think it's, it will be the people that step up and want to take on those roles that aren't just architecture, you know, it's business development, it's marketing, it's, it's the business of architecture. Mm -hmm all these things and um you know and i think that some people should want to focus on just projects yeah and just clients and so that you can have that focus because you know i, I think of all the things that i can't focus on on a project you know that 
I'd like to often, but because there are other things that are pushing and pulling you in different directions, and we don't want we don't need everyone with those kinds of distractions. It's it's quite an interesting distinction that you that you make that you know it's not everyone shouldn't have the ambition to be partner necessarily, even though you know and again this is kind of one of the pitfalls of having a hierarchy in the traditional sense is that you know you're making distinctions that this role is better than this role or this is somehow a, a a higher run of of the of the ladder where it's kind of a different expression of leadership you might yeah, say well yeah you know i mean i think we're all trained in in the world to sort of move up the ladder like mm-hmm. everyone has to get to like what does that mean what is what does the top of the ladder mm-hmm. mean i don't i don't think there should be a top i think the ladder should be horizontal yeah you know, and I think you should be able to move sort of left and right. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe you maybe you land in the center because you're balancing the left and the right. You know, I don't I don't know how that really should work, but I think we need to challenge those um, those that thinking. Yeah, um, because so- it you know when people think that that's the the direction i think that it that's that's what sets up i think certain firms for failure Mm -hmm. as far as a legacy firm um you know is it what is it about i mean it should be about people that have interest in in certain things i mean there's a great example we have a guy in our office that has been here for i don't know probably 18 or 19 years and he does most of our visual work renderings 3d models things you know all of those and he's he's really great at it and you know he also does photography and those are two things that he challenged us with he's we said in a review one time and he said hey or we said you know what what is it that you're passionate about what do you really want to do and he said you know if i could just do renderings i would i would be happy and we thought really and he said yes i'd be really happy and i could really you know focus on my skill and make it better and and he's done that over time you know be Mm. careful what you ask for right (laughs) because that's that's what he's that's what he's been doing but i mean i really admire Mm -hmm. um his his approach to that because he he knew the skill set that he had he wanted to be the best he could be at it Mm -hmm. um and and he is continuing now you know to do that and we know that you know i've just seen him like get better and more efficient and all, all these things. And, you know, I could say, I could have a different example for many people in our office, but I, I think that one is an interesting one because, you know, it is so specific. Um, it's, it's a very, very focused. What, what would you, how would you say that you've nurtured or created a culture of belonging in the, in the business? So, cause again, this, I, I really like this conversation of you know, there, there are certain attributes that, say, a founder or a partner needs to have. They need to be able to understand the marketing. They need to understand the business side of the, of, of an architecture practice. And they need to be damn good designers as well. You can't, yeah. you know, you need to have all three components. Um, but then that's not going to be for everybody. Um, as, as, as you say, there's going to be people who, are, who want to just go deep into their craft and we yeah. want to make sure yeah. that they've got space to grow and to excel and that they're supported by the the rest of the um you know the rest of the environment the rest of the team and not feel like they're they're missing out by not pursuing the partnership route if you like yeah yeah well you know i i think a lot of things that i wanted for this firm early on were maybe things that i experienced at other firms Mm -hmm. that i felt made kept separation between partners or seniors or whatever. And I I think a lot of that was um, people always said, Hey, uh, we're a family, you know, that's well, well, sure. We're all a professional family, but you know, what does that mean? We try not to even say that uh, because inherently we're sort of a community of designers that are like-minded that want to work together. And I think, you know, one of the things that I think, that's helped us nurture that is we've been really focused on making sure we hire people that play really well in the sandbox. You know, uh, if you have an ego, just check it and stay home, you know, don't bring it into the office. And I think that, you know, you see, I mean, I I saw someone recently give something to someone um, 
and this was a person that I, that they don't give that much, but I saw how much, how happy it made the person that did the giving. And, and I think that's probably true here. Once someone experiences how they're helping someone else, you know, you, you get a lot from that. I mean, I, you know, I, people always ask me, when, what am I most proud of? What project are you most proud of? And I can never answer that. I always think, you know, I'm actually most proud of all the people that I work with um, every day. I mean, I come in um, to work and accomplish things for them. I often don't think I'm coming in to do things for me. Um, I want to make this a better place, you know, for them. Mm. Um, much like we want to make a project a better thing for our clients. Now, I just think that that attitude, you know, it it sort of ripples, I think, through the through the firm. Um, if you have a culture like that, it's you've got to participate. Everyone has to play in the sandbox the same way. Mm-hmm. Now, I think the other thing I would say is just transparency. You know, we're trying to be really transparent about as many things as as we can, you know, I mean, you hear about organizations that are saying, oh, we should be transparent with salaries and well, we're not, we're not going that far. Right. You know, you have to draw the line somewhere, but I think, you know, we, a lot of people help with proposals. A lot of people help and do contracts and work on fees. And so it's not just a senior, it might be someone that um, is just, you know, a year or so out of school everyone's participating, you know, in those things. And mm. I think it gets back to this sort of flat um, hierarchy. I mean, I want the, I think one of the things that's most important about that is people in the office should feel like they can challenge a partner or a principal. If they can't challenge us, if they can't argue something a different way, then they really don't have a voice. And, and I think, I think that's, I think that's something that keeps people here. You know, I really, I think probably you'd have to ask that question to, to the people that are here in the office, because I don't know if I would, I don't know if I'm answering it correctly for them, but that's how I think about it. That's what I, that's what I think has happened because mm-hmm. I'm seeing that every day. I mean, I see people that hang out together and, and <clears throat> they're enjoying each other's conversation, whether it's about architecture or or not. And, and I think it's, you know, it just gets back to the simple, you know, uh, moms and dads taught us to play well in the sandbox when we were kids for a reason. Um, some kids didn't, and some kids did. And usually yeah. the ones that did played longer yeah, um, and had more fun and learned more. Absolutely. And, you, you mentioned there as well, this idea of, of transparency and there being limits to, you know, of, of transparent of, of being transparent and I think that's that's very wise and, and there is also a responsibility that comes for the person who is being exposed to certain data as well and I've seen it before in businesses where people have been given the responsibility or you know the office has gone and started to be very transparent and then people who have seen the data haven't necessarily been responsible already for the you know what comes with knowing that sort of information um and it can, right. it can quickly become a, a like a quite a complicated complicated situation so how have you guys maintained a healthy attitude and conversation that balances you know the need for being profitable on a project with the design and also with the, with the design and you know advancing the city at large as well because there's quite a strong you know, mission behind what it is that you guys are doing. Yeah. Um, it, it is a delicate balance, you know, I mean, I think <clears throat> I've always had, <clears throat> I've always had the approach that we don't look at hours on a project <laughs> because if we do, and we only have 10 hours left, <laughs> but we have 40 hours more of work to do <laughs> to make this a good project, we're going to fall short. And I think it's this idea that, you know, you, you win some and you lose some mm-hmm. um, is, is really important because you can sell a project short by just focusing on the amount of time that you have to be profitable or not be profitable. So, you know, I, I remember one year, I mean, I, I was thinking this was, I don't know how old we were, maybe 10 years in the firm. And I was thinking, 
this year, have we worked on a profitable project? You know, I mean, I, I don't want to look at the hours, but it didn't feel like it. Yeah. And, and, but I take that with a sort of a grain of salt because there are so many factors in what we do that can make something profitable or not. You know, it, we may have the, the best, most efficient team that you could imagine on a project, but this project has all these issues. Maybe the budget wasn't enough. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe there were issues with the site that no one anticipated. I mean, there's so many factors that could play into making something not profitable. And, you know, we're, you know, architects, I think for centuries have sort of shot themselves in the foot about, you know, like, how do you do, how do you do fees? It's always about, you know, who's doing a lower fee than the other fee. And I I don't know how that needs to change, but I mean, I wish in the next, you know, 10 years that we as a profession think about how do we rethink how we deal with fees that are more equitable for clients and for us. Um, You know, how do you, how do you think about a project early on when you don't really know what you're doing? You know, you don't know how it's going to develop. You don't know all the issues that, that might, that might come out of that. Um, So that's a tough one. And that's one that I think architects have been talking about a long time. I'm probably not the one that's going to solve it. Um, (laughs) But it, it's one that needs to really be discussed more in our profession. Do, do you have a number of different approaches then that you take as a business to try and mitigate the risks of getting the fee wrong then in, in the business? And as you, as you say, you know, we, the, the kind of you know, we're at this, you know, when you're putting together your fee proposal for a, for a project right at the outset of it, you're often doing it at the time where you know the least amount of information about yeah. the project and therefore there's an enormous amount of, of risk to be, um, you know, to kind of be signing up for. So w- yeah. what ways have yeah. you tried in the past to try and mitigate your own risks? Yeah, with, we started, you know, with on? a lot of, with our small projects and smaller clients early on, we had what we called uh, just a one, a one page proposal. Right. And it would be sort of a first phase. So we would, we would go to them and say, look, we're, we want to charge just this amount of fee not a lot, mm-hmm. but we want to sort of see if we can define the scope. Like, what are you doing? I mean, if it's if it's on a site that seems complex, you know, let's study something more about the site. What kind of submittals do we need to make to the city? If we can learn more about it, then you could arguably have a, a, a fee that they don't have to worry about changing because you run into surprises. Um, we would usually sell it on the idea that, we could make sure the consultants were more lean because if we could define a certain amount, then the consultants, the, all the engineers don't have to guess at what we're doing because mm-hmm. they're sort of in the same position we're in. Um, we might be imagining what this is going to look like, or, you know, maybe it's a three story building and a certain size. They have no clue. They have no insight um, that early. They might know I'm just going to do a mechanical system in here and, I uh, don't know how many zones it needs because we don't know the direction of the glass that's, you know, on the building. And so I think, you know, this, what we called a quick hit proposal was, was one way. And we continue to do that as much as we can. I mean, we're submitting um, for something today, an interiors project. And we talked about that just yesterday. I mean, the client was sharing an idea with us about what they want to do. And, you know, when they talk about it, it seems very simple. But when we imagine what all is going to need to be done, it's more radical um, mm-hmm. and more complex. So you don't want to scare them with a fee uh, because they're thinking it's one way and you're thinking it's another. So can we hit a middle ground and sort of define a bit about what we're doing? Um, I think that's that's a really good way to do that. Do, do you have a, a kind of preference to whether you do a fixed lump sum or whether you charge as a percentage of construction or you do things on hourly or do you use kind of hybrids and make it situational? Yeah, all the above. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really all the, you know, I mean, we have clients on occasion that just say, hey, we just, we want a lump sum fee. We, we know the scope pretty well um, and we don't want to be, obligated if for example um 
prices escalate like they have in the last couple of years. You know, mm-hmm. why should we pay you a lot more uh, because something escalated? So there's a lot. Some um, some clients are more comfortable with hourly. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they're few and further between. Uh, we've done more of that in the past early on than we've done maybe in the last five or so years. Uh, percentage fee is probably the more common way that we do this. Right. Um, it seems to be a fair way. And, you know, you have clients that think, well, you have no, you have no incentive to keep the project cost down. Well, if we have a budget and a contract that states what the budget is, you know, yes, we, we do have an incentive um, to do that. So, um, it, but I think the mix, and I mean, I usually try to approach it in a, a way that, I uh, think the client is uh, comfortable with. Um, I remember once on one of our early clients would work with him quite a bit and he came to us, we gave him, we gave him a lump sum fee and he said, yo, that's just too much. I mean, it's just more than I want. I, I just, can I just pay you guys hourly? And we, I said, sure. But you know, hourly, there's a good chance if it doesn't go your way, it's going to be more than this fee. And he said, well, I can't imagine that. Well, I remember getting the call where he said, <laughs> wow, you, I think I've paid what the lump sum was. And I said, yeah, we're not quite finished yet, but we will be soon. You know, so he said, can I change it back to the lump sum? Uh, but, you know, that's that's the complexity of, of those things. And, you know, we're, I think, generally pretty good at, um, you know, you also sort of hone that skill over time. Um think you have to you have to get burned enough to understand there are projects that you just shouldn't take um yeah that's it's just fee based or um the client's not being reasonable and um you you just should move on and you shouldn't put yourself in that situation what what is what are some of the the red flags for you nowadays where you know that this is not a project and you you know when to politely end the conversation and shake hands and part ways yeah, well, the big one, probably my only real red flag is just when the client can't reasonably think about what a construction budget is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if it's, if you, you think you're the professional and you think it's over $200 a foot, and if they're mm-hmm. thinking it's $100 a foot, for example, it's just not realistic. And I think when there's that much disparity, it's just better um, to, to walk away and and not try to um, just try not to go down a road that's that would be very um, discomfort uncomfortable. Yeah, brilliant, great. What do you have uh, planned for Archimania for the rest of twenty twenty three and beyond? Yeah, well, you know we're 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 at a really interesting moment, I think, because. Um, all this time, 28 years of this firm. And, you know, as I told you earlier, we've, we started with a lot of small projects and tight budgets, and now we've done bigger projects with bigger budgets, and we're still doing that. We'll never, we'll, we'll always do those smaller projects. We won't shy away from those clients or those projects because I think it's important to our city and it's important to our firm. But, you know, thinking ahead, we're, we're, we'll have in the next few years this, a new body of work that has, that's much much larger than we've had in the past. We're doing, we just completed a project at the University of Memphis, a music school. It's about a 50 or $60 million project. And it's it's really a a wonderful project for the campus. So we haven't had campus work. Now we have campus work and we have a a music venue. And we've, we've had a lot of focus on music venues. I mean, again, going back to the river and the blues, you know, it's all this stuff comes forward. So, we also um, finalizing, like I said earlier, the CDs on the Brooks. The Brooks will start uh, moving forward in construction in a few months. And, you know, it's a project of a little over $100 million um, with a parking garage below it. So that's one that will uh, will help build our portfolio. We have another project that's probably in a $50 million range uh, that's at a new Ford facility. That's a training facility for them. That's just, um, just east of Memphis, uh, out, just outside of our city. So projects like that give us a new size and it's allowing us to compete. We've been competing 
uh, more recently on much larger projects. We've, you know, a, another international firm reached out to us recently and we submitted a proposal together. We didn't win it, but we're seeing, we're seeing more of that. And we're seeing that we're, you know, we're down to the, the last two, um, you know, and we're going to win some of those. We're going to lose some of those, but I think it just opens up a new, you know, new opportunities for us. And let's, let's see how we can continue to grow and continue to uh, build our firm and build our city. Amazing. Brilliant. Well, Todd, that's the perfect yeah. place for us to conclude the conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and your insights and, you know, some real gems of wisdom there of um, how to, how to keep a practice um, deepening and advancing a city as well as being profitable. So thank you very well, much for your time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.